And this is it. It doesn't look much, rather like a xylophone bound in copper wire, but this, fully developed, could be the motor which will whisk you and your grandchildren around this country at speeds of up to 250 miles per hour. Well, I suppose the best way to uh, explain it is to demonstrate it. This is a piece of aluminium. When I switch current into these coils, watch what happens. The sheet is propelled along by invisible forces. It's just as if there was a magnetic river flowing along there, producing waves of magnetic field which are dragging this along. I want you to see every one of those teeth as being comparable to one of these rods in this mechanical model. Now the rods can move only up and down. When I turn the handle, watch what happens. You see, as it were, waves or ripples travelling along. And if I put something in the trough of one of the waves, that has to go along too. So, in, in very simple terms, it's rather like what a child uh, sitting in a bathtub, making ripples with its fingers and propelling the soap dish along. It's a exactly. That is precisely. If this were the soap dish, and the child starts to make ripples in the water, and the soap dish goes along. Right. So that is our hover train. Well, no, actually, if that were to be the hover train, we should need hundreds of miles of this all along the track. And putting these windings into slots is expensive. It would be much less expensive to have hundreds of miles of this. Now, let me show you another experiment. Suppose I get a bigger sheet, I turn on the current, and then I put the bigger sheet down on the motor. Now, it's pushing me that way. You're really struggling with it. Really struggling with it. Eventually, the coils themselves have to go. So what we're going to do is to mount this on the track, have hundreds of miles of that, turn the motor over and mount this on the vehicle. Yes. So now let's put our vehicle on the top. There you have your model of a hover train. Fine. And so that has become our engine and that is forcing itself away from the aluminium base. Yeah, across the top of the aluminium strip. All right. Well, now, uh, to a layman, I think tremendous friction. I also think pretty rough ride. How do we have Oh, well, of course, the whole thing is floating. Ah. Let me show you this on something which actually is floating. Now, although I haven't got an air cushion system, I can support an aluminium plate by electromagnetism, like this. This, you see, is free to move up and down a track. Now, once you're supported away from the ground, there are only three ways that I know that you can propel yourself along. The first fairly obvious one is that you put an air screw on the vehicle, like that. The second is that you could put a rocket on it. And again, I haven't got a rocket, but I'm going to simulate a rocket by means of a catapult. When I like the string, the missile will go one way, and the vehicle the other. When engineered, that becomes a rocket. The third method we've already talked about is the linear motor. To use this, we've got to build a piece of aluminium strip along the track so that it can react against it. And here is now the row of coils, which I hope is familiar to you. We float this and then switch the linear motor off. Now, when you consider these three methods, for example, in the light of uh, the need for no pollution, both the air screw and the rocket will pollute the atmosphere. They will also disturb the atmosphere, so that you couldn't run such vehicles directly into a city because you would blow everybody and they're washing about. The linear motor will neither pollute the atmosphere nor will it disturb the air. Both air screw and rocket in the full-scale vehicles would make a large amount of noise. The linear motor is silent. There are other bonuses to linear motors too. You see, it has inherently no moving parts. Whereas rotary motors, as they go faster and faster, would tend to burst, there are no bursting speeds in the case of linear motors. Maintenance would be very small indeed, because there's nothing to go wrong. So it's not surprising that 
of the countries in the world today who are trying experiments on high-speed transport, they're all now going for linear motor propulsion. Well, Professor, it's, it's marvellous playing with these models, these, these uh, very impressive toys, but it, it's been a long time happening, really. I mean, is it really feasible, is it really practicable, the linear engine? Well, I believe so. You see, linear motors, I've seen them come from just an idea, almost, uh, up to the um, commercial exploitation. Linear motors are used in industry now for a variety of jobs. Uh, whether they'll be used for high-speed transport or not still remains to be seen, but a number of countries seem to think so. Mm. I mean, is, is cost one of the big factors against you? Because the amount of current that you're going to burn up to shift a hover train is colossal. Yeah, cost is, is always the thing you fight. You can do almost anything at a price, and it's a question of finding out what that price is. It's not so much the amount of current they burn, because you'd have to use that amount of power to push a vehicle through the air at 250 miles an hour, no matter how you did it. Mm. But it's the cost of the track and the cost of all the apparatus that goes with it. Mm. So if, if we want to travel very, very quickly, we've got to pay for it. There's always a price to pay. Uh, you'll not travel at 250 miles an hour at uh, ordinary British rail prices, that's for sure. Well, let's bring it down to ground. Um, Foulness from the proposed airport to the centre of London. Now, using a linear motored hover train, how quickly do you think you could get a passenger from there into London? Well, what is it, 50 to 60 miles? About, about 56, we think. Uh, you'd need about three miles to accelerate and mm. three miles to stop. And if you could do the distance in between at 250 miles an hour, you might do the whole journey in 15 minutes.